What's going on people? We are Tottenham TV here. More content for you from Tel Aviv Beach here. We've got a Tottenham update. Still in Israel, coming home tomorrow if our flight doesn't get cancelled. Uh, bloody whiz air. But we've got a few uh, different things to talk about today. First of all, I want to talk about Lucas Mora and his Instagram message upon leaving Israel. He, he did this whole long, um, literally this whole long thing, all in Hebrew. And basically the, the gist of it was that it's a place that he's been wanting to go for for a long time. It was an amazing uh, place for him to come and all the support he got from the fans. And also what he was saying is he wants to come back after his career's over and discover every single part of the country. So it was really nice to hear from Lucas. Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting on Brazilians because I believe Ronaldinho has a big uh, affiliation with Israel, with Israel. And he, they've had like football tournaments and, and, and um, charity matches that Ronaldinho's hosted here and stuff like that. So maybe it's uh, very much in, uh, for like with a lot of the Brazilians, they like to come here. Uh, and it was lovely, nice for him to leave that message. And maybe, you never know, maybe he'll end his career in Israel. <laughs> no, I wouldn't go that far. He's definitely going to end in like Sao Paulo or something. But um, would be, I think. Look, it's great, great that he uh, had such a good time, and it's good to him to speak so nicely of it. Yeah, absolutely. But let's get on to some actual transfer news now. As Javi Yokera uh, was talking yesterday, it was, and he says tonight the issue of Lacelso and Villarreal can be defined once and, and once and for all, and Villarreal have made uh, their official offer. There was a little bit more on him. Uh, someone called Gaston Edul, who's a works for TYC Sport and he's saying in the next hours there'll be a final meeting between Villarreal and Spurs for Lo Celso and the player is cu currently in Spain and the backup option is Fiorentina and yeah that's right because I did see on Instagram there was uh, him taking pictures with um, a few different players out in Spain so it looks like this one is ticking along now. Yeah Master I believe said that uh, Villarreal made a bid of um, a loan deal with an obligation to buy for 12 and a half million. does seem uh, a bit on the cheap side, but I think at this point, look, you get over 10 million, you move on. Although part of me feels like, do we hold out until the World Cup? And maybe if he has a good World Cup, his stock could rise a lot more. But because he is pretty good for Argentina, isn't he? Um, but yeah, but we know how he's performed well for Argentina. He's performed well for Villarreal. World Cup is World Cup to World Cup. You know, what I mean, if you if you play well in the World Cup, that's a different kettle of fish. But look, for me, I think. We get a deal done. Um, we're losing a lot of money, but we knew we were going to lose a lot of money, and that is what it is. What it is. Hopefully, uh, the quicker we can get him out, maybe leaves room to get some more in uh, before the end of the window. Um, but I think there is a possibility if we did wait to the World Cup, you could probably get a better deal. Mm, potentially. Next up, Santi Auna is talking about Nicolo, Nicolo Zaniolo, and he says new discussions are planned this week between Roma and Tottenham over Zaniolo. Um, and I did see a report as well that Roma are asking for around in excess of 50 million. Um, a Roma publication. I mean, I don't have it here in front of me, but I do remember seeing that they were wanting in excess of 50 million and they're proving quite difficult to deal with and if we can't get it sealed and signed sealed and delivered this week we are going to move on to other targets yeah and also the apparently uh, Mourinho is trying to uh, stop the deal uh, that's what I that's what I was reading as well um, which doesn't surprise me he probably doesn't want to help us um, but 40 to 50 you do anything to stop Daniel Levy in his honestly, tracks <laughs> he was getting Roma to waste time after 50 minutes in a friendly just to get one over on us <laughs> honestly the pettiness is unbelievable but um, I think for, for that price if it's going through off we're talking excess of 50 million euros um, I don't know I, I, I just feel like that's that's where we're paying right now um, I think when when there was talk of a loan with an obligation to buy option to buy that definitely seems right, uh, right up our street. But when you're talking about a potentially 50 million euro uh, bid, if that's if that's what we're talking about, then you could very well look. They're, they're talking about Madison to Newcastle for 50 billion, aren't they? So why wouldn't you just you know go for that? I think that, that's what I would that's what I would go for. But apparently they're also thinking about Zaniolo wing back as well, wing back and right. I can't right. see that being a case. I can't see that being a case. I think he's got the profile for it, dribbling ability. Um, he's got very powerful running. Just a question mark is like, could he defend and stuff like that? Like, like, could he be a Perisic on that side? He could very well be. He could very well be a, like a Perisic kind of player. Uh, and imagine like Zaniolo, Kulusevski, um, Kane, Son, and Perisic. That kind of, all of that, you know, that would be frightening. Um, so look, even if we do overpay, I'm still going to be excited by this deal, whatever happens. But I do like, just logically, I do feel like that kind of money would be overpaying for him. 
I genuinely don't care if we overpay or not, to be honest. I mean, we've got so much money to play with in this window. I personally think Zaniolo is a better fit for us than Madison anyway. And um, I, I would pay the money. If it was up to me, I would pay the money. I mean, <laughs> it's not like uh, we're overpaying and we're going to be like screwing our whole budget. We've got so much money still to play with. We've only got a net spend at the moment of like 60 million of the, you know, considered 150 million that we had um, at the start of the window. You know, at least we've got so much more money to play with. So with the money that we've got available to us, we should be able to spend that kind of money on that kind of profile of play and a centre back as well when you when you really think about it. So I'm really not too fussed about overpaying too much. Yeah, I agree. Um, and, unless it's going to hurt uh, other potential signings, which it shouldn't. Um, yeah, it's, I think I think you're right. Just if, if that's all the, the number one priority, I think push the boat out and just get it done. And it's interesting on Zaniolo uh, because... I was speaking to someone that was at, that was actually had like quite an in-depth chat with uh, Paratici in uh, the hotel, and um, he he actually asked him why why are we going um, for Zaniolo and Madison? Why are we going for these kind of players when Conte doesn't really play with an attacking midfielder? And and then he goes to him, look with Madison, I think you've actually got a point, but when you look at Zaniolo, he goes Zaniolo, Kulusevski. He sees them as like direct competition, I think. Mm. Makes sense. So that's why as well, like, is what I was saying before, why I think Zaniolo is a more of a fit to us than a Madison. Fair enough. Look, I don't, I'm not going to profess to know more about you know, than Conte and Paratici. I just feel uh, that we could do with more of a Madison in terms of profile. But, uh, but look, I'm going to absolutely love Zaniolo if he comes and I'm going to be super excited. I think he's a really exciting player. And as well, um, he could really explode next season after a really good f first season back from injury. So we could be getting him at a good, good time in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on. Let's talk about Joe Roden now because we brought you the news a couple of days ago how he was set to seal his loan move to Wren. And that has finally been completed as of yesterday. There's pictures of uh, him up in the Wren shirt uh, looking very happy. And he's put a message out to the Spurs fans on social media. And it says, thank you, Spurs official. I wish you all the success this season with a blue heart and come on you Spurs. So big up Joe Roden. And obviously we wish him the best of success this season. Yeah, season on loan, loan with a 20 million euro option to buy. So Spurs make a profit if that um, turns out. Uh, Liga, a, ch a chance for him to really um, play week and week out. A decent team in Liga. Uh, I believe they got European football last season. So it's a good opportunity for him ahead of the uh, World Cup to really get that game time. And um, it's just a very odd one because I, I was reading Dan Kilpatrick uh, yeah, um, uh, today said that Roden was definitely more of a club signing than a Mourinho signing. He said Mourinho never really identified him, but he needed we needed a centre back, and um, the club decided to go for him. Um, and although. All, all the managers he's worked under have always praised him in public. They've never given him a chance. And uh, Mourinho did start to give him a chance towards the end. Yeah, he did, and he was he was playing quite well. But he never really even. But even I know at the end he did. But he, uh, during his tenure, he never really got a proper run. Um, and then it's, it's, it's just a bit odd why that was the case. Even though for Wales as well, he plays very well. So I'm looking forward to see how he does for Wren. Um, but the, the, if he does too well, then we're not going to. It's a bit of a weird one. If he does too well, we're not going to keep him. And if he doesn't do that well, then do we want him back? So it's a bit of an odd one uh, when it comes to this kind of deal. But it also it depends if Wren actually have that money to stump up as well, because you know these figures could actually seem quite a lot for like these kind of teams sometimes. It's a fair point. Um, so that could be the case, but. Uh, I'm not going to look too far uh, in terms of Ren's finances. Um, but I think uh, hopefully he has a good season and maybe his stock will start to rise again. But I think he needed this deal because he was just stagnating too much and it was hurting him. So good luck to him. I hope he does well. And I'll be keeping a keen eye on what, how he's doing. Absolutely. Uh, next up, we've got, um, we've got Ben Jacobs was talking on the Last Word on Spurs podcast, and he says Tottenham are loosely in the race for Milan Skriniar. What does loosely in the race mean? We're not in the race, that's <laughs> what it means for Milan. So it means like we're probably like just seeing what we're, uh, uh, what, what, what their price is, and then we're like, okay, no, and that's probably it. Like we probably made some inquiries or something. I don't know. But look, I don't see why we shouldn't be. If we're not going to get Bastoni and they're willing to sell Skriniar, why has that deal with PSG not gone through yet? There has to be a reason why it's dragging. Usually when deals drag this much, I mean, they do obviously get done, but a lot of the times there is usually a reason and a lot of the times uh, it falls flat. So if it isn't happening with PSG, we should definitely pursue that because he will be a brilliant fit for us. 
And as well, it makes even more sense to get Skriniar now after bringing Longley because he can comfortably fit there on the left-hand side and Skriniar will slot lovely into the centre. Exactly, and also Skriniar can play on the left as well. So I think it makes complete sense that he's a high-quality centre-back. I think he's been, he, Conte knows him. Um, he'd be a fantastic addition. Um, so I don't know what we're, uh, what we're waiting for. Although, in an interesting way, Conte did try to get rid of him when he was at Inter. Uh, after that, he worked his way back in and he was one of his most trusted defenders. Yes, which is true. But it, why did he want to get rid of him initially? Which would be of an odd one. Uh, that was the same with Ericsson, right? He wanted to get rid of Ericsson and then Ericsson fought his way in. So it shows like, if, if you work under Conte and you follow his way and you really knuckle down, you can change his mind. Yeah, I don't think... Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, so, I'm not, no, I'm not, saying that, uh, I'm not saying that he's not a great player. I'm just thinking... If Conte initially, I don't think it was a case of working hard or anything. I just, I feel like Conte initially didn't believe he was the perfect fit for how he wanted his centre backs. Now, obviously, he proved him wrong and won the league, but does he still have any reservations about his nat natural suitability to that role? And does he, would he rather, in a, in a perfect world, someone else rather than Skriniar? I, I wonder if that's uh, the case. But for me, I think he would be definitely an upgrade on what we have. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, I'd love to see Milan screening off through the door. But another defender who we're being linked with is Max Kilman. And Ben Jacob said on Last Word on Spurs that Tottenham have scouted Kilman but haven't made any um, move for him as of yet. I mean, I'm a, I think Max Kilman is an absolutely brilliant player. And I think he's very young, English, uh, ticks those boxes. And I think uh, year on year for Wolves, he's getting better, better. Uh, really good ball playing ability, really aggressive. And I'd, I'd actually love to see him through the door. Yeah, very underrated. I think if he wasn't at Wolves, if he was at a better team, no disrespect to Wolves, but if, uh, if he was maybe a better team, he would get a bit more recognition because I think he's a youngster who um, you know, broke through. At, uh, I, think, I can't remember if he broke through at Wolves or not, but I remember him playing at a very young age in the Wolves first team. And he's kind of kept his place all the way through. And he's really developed himself. I don't know if you saw, he scored well, uh, in pre-season one of the best goals you'll see. Yeah, like that. running from his own half. into like That shows his ability to dribble and uh, for a centre-back as well. That shows what kind of quality he has. I know it's a pre-season friendly, but... Um, you know, you're not, you're not going to see many centre-backs go on a run like that, uh, even against the worst opposition. So, for me, um, I actually think he could be a very good signing for us. And it's one that could go under the radar, um, but I think that could be one of the more astute signings we could make in that position. And he's uh, a bit versatile as well. I reckon he could play left wing back at, at, a, at quite a decent level. I haven't seen evidence for that. I've seen evidence for he's got good ball bearing ability. Could he play wing back? I think the way we play wing back, I don't know if he could do that role. It's very specialised. You need to almost be a winger. I don't know if he could do that role. But he definitely could be a, that, that overlapping centre back where he gets forward and helps out the attack. He definitely could do that role. All right, let's move on. Uh, Demazio is talking and he says AC Milan had the possibility to buy Tanganga as a centre back and Regulon as a left back. But. Um, in the end have decided to look elsewhere so apparently that comes to a close with the Tanganga and AC Milan story and also the Regulon and AC Milan story so not going to AC? apparently not no or does, he, or does, he, or does he mean there was a double deal and they didn't is he looking but they're looking elsewhere for both that's interesting so maybe so I wonder what's gonna happen with uh, Tanganga then because I thought that looked like it had legs especially if it was a loan deal uh, maybe maybe we couldn't agree uh, a fee on the option to buy or anything like that, or maybe we didn't want an option. Uh, must, he was always with the final de finer details with Tottenham. We're very specific with all these kind of things, so it doesn't surprise me totally that that's what probably broke the deal down. Um, but it must be a blow for Tanganga because at the moment, uh, he doesn't look like he's getting a left look in at Tottenham, uh, especially first team-wise, in terms of being a regular first, first 11. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with him now. In terms of Regulon, uh, I never thought that was going to happen. To be honest, uh, Tara Ter Hernandez got that nail, uh, position nailed down, so I, d I didn't really see him going to AC Milan. All right, uh, let's move on. Let's talk about some news from Fabrizio Romano, and he says Tottenham, alongside Newcastle, also like James Madison, but they are yet to submit an offer. Unlike Newcastle, who have had an offer rejected already, um, it looks as though we are kind of favouring Zaniolo over James Madison at the moment. That's what the noise is especially from the Italian uh, press. Uh, I look, I just think we don't, ha like, in terms of the formation, you probably have a good point on Zaniola being a better fit. But I just think, if you look throughout our squad, who, wh who, which player, apart from Kane, 
can really either pick a lock, find a creative pass, uh, pick the uh, drive uh, through the lines, maybe pick one out from the edge of the area. We don't have that. We just don't, I can't think of a player really in our squad who's very good at that apart from Kane. So that's an issue for me. Um, and I think th that's why I'd love a midfielder who can, who can help out in that department. The problem would be, I, and I can see the problem, would be fitting him in somewhere. And especially with someone like Madison, ain't going to come and sit on the bench. That's, that's, that we know that for sure. So where would he fit in a 4-3-4-3? That's a good question. Because is, he's, not a, he's not a natural for the number 10 position, although I do believe he could play there. And you don't want him in the pivot, that's for sure. I don't think he would work in the pivot. So there's not really a proper pace, uh, space for him. And so you see, then so you can argue, OK, so you play a 3-5-2. I think he does have a place in 3-5-2. But again, who are you dropping? Is it Kulusevski? Then you've got Kulusevski, Kulusevski and Richarlison will be on the bench a lot. Um, then, and, then, and, you know, you're changing your a whole new way of playing. You know, 3-5-2 is quite, you know, a bit different to 3-4-3. Three, three, and, you, have, you know, you have to get used to that formation. So from that point of view, it's difficult to see this Madison signing working. But in terms of the kind of player that is missing from the squad, I think he's perfect. Yeah, look, look, I completely agree with you. I mean, I'm not, I'm not denying. When I say I prefer Zaniola over Madison, I'm not denying that we need a player like Madison, uh, the qualities that he has to, you know, unlock that uh, defence, you know, pick that pass and stuff like that. But, like you say, I just can't see a way that Madison comes here because he's want to come play consistent football and it's just not going to happen in the, in the formation that we play. Yeah, unless we can train him to play in one of the two and number 10s. And if, if for me, if you were to play him there, It'd probably suit the left one more cutting inside, although he's got a very good left foot, to be fair. He's pretty two-footed. Um, so he could play, you know, like how Ericsson used to play on the right-hand side for us. He could do that role, um, but he's obviously he doesn't. He's not used to doing that, so he'd have to be retrained at that. Um, and he could be competition for Kulisevsky there. And imagine the forward options if we get someone like Madison, all of a sudden you've got, you know, all the forward options we have now plus Madison. That would be mouth-watering. Mouth um, but, I, yeah, I just feel like if he... You know, you could probably look at Newcastle and think, all right, I'm going to play in that number 10 position every week. There's a space for me. At Tottenham, it's like, there, there, there is potentially a space for me, but is it the perfect position for me? Is it where I really want to, is it the best? And it could work out, but then again, it's a bit of a risk from his side. And then also we're splashing 60 million on a player that doesn't necessarily have a perfect fit for us. Whereas with Richarlison, it's a bit different. We know exactly what we wanted with him. We needed a player who can cover Kane and Son, and he can do that. Um, for Madison's a bit different, but again, I think the play here is is a hole in the squad that could need filling. All right, and the last bit of transfer news we've got is from Sky Sports, and they say Marseille and Galatasaray are among the potential options for Tangi Undombele this summer. Finally, some names coming. Uh, Marseille and Galatasaray. I mean, how do you think? First of all, Tangi will be feeling about that, and how much wages do you reckon we're going to have to put into the pot as well? Oh, yeah, a lot. I don't think Marseille have a lot of money. Uh, Galatasaray, I don't know what the Turkish league is uh, like. I don't know I don't know if they've got which are rich owners or whatever. Um, but it's definitely going to be a loan. It'd have to be a loan. I don't even know if there'll be an option to buy him there. It might be just straight loan. I reckon he'd probably rather go out to go to Marseille, back to his native France. He'll probably be happier there. Um, but again, we've seen, we've, we've heard so many names when it comes to Ndombele. It's hard to get excited by any new names, isn't it? So I'm going to wait. I was believe it when I see it kind of thing. All right, and now, uh, unfortunately, we need to bring you some injury news and squad news. First of all, Oli Skip. Uh, we did bring you on Twitter that Oli Skip could be um, not involved in the first game of the season, and Ali Gold has confirmed that. Says Oli Skip is currently unlikely to be back in time for the Premier League opener against Southampton, and we're hearing he did have a bit of a fracture, didn't we? Potentially, yeah, but we'll, according to our source, Conte said he had a fracture at the top of his foot. Now, that's not confirmed by anything from the club, but that's what we've been told. Um, we don't know if it's a serious fracture. We don't, we don't know. It's not guaranteed it is a fracture, but they, there is concern that it could well be a fracture at the top of his foot. Now, the fact that, it, it would, from what Ali Gold said, there was a stud that went through the boot and ended up um, being quite a gruesome injury, he said, that people were taken aback, didn't he? Some of his teammates were taken aback. That could very well lead to a fracture, for sure. Uh, and I think they initially just thought it was a deep cut, and now they're starting to suspect it could be worse. And if it is, it's very harsh, because people call him injury prone, but it's just a freak incident. And there's not much you can do about that. It's not, it's not necessarily like it's a, 
Because when you call a player injury prone, it's more like a lamella injury or a uh, Ledley King injury where they have, a, they have one thing which is going to constantly be bothering them and it keeps happening again and again. Let's say like a hamstring keeps going or, uh, or, then, or you know, a King where his knee is going to be the same injury. It's a different situation. It's a different situation when Skip. It's just he's had a freak incident. So I think it's harsh people calling him injury prone, but with the fact that, the fact that he's had all this time out, it's going to happen, isn't it? Yeah. He's going to be that label. Yeah, 100%, and it's just unfortunate. Really is unfortunate, because I was so excited uh, to see him kick off the season. But hopefully he's not out for too long. Um, it's not a fracture. We don't know for sure, but it sounds like it might be. And another uh, quite frustrating one is Yves Bissouma. Uh, we're hearing from our source that Yves Bissouma could be, um, is unlikely to play, let's say, this weekend, but hopefully he won't be out for too long. Yeah, yeah. Um I was thinking about it. everyone's panicking about oh, Basuma and Skip being out. We need another midfielder. We need to sign someone. But I was thinking, like, first of all, Basuma isn't going to be. It shouldn't be out for too long. And for the for the for the for the until the end of August, we're only playing in one position, one competition. We're playing five league games. So Benton and Hoybe should have that covered. If if look, if worse comes to worse, and Basuma's out for a month, which we're not saying he is at all. Um, they told us we we heard it's a light injury. And he's probably out of the game, which suggests that he'll be back in the next week or two. Exactly. So I'm not too worried about that. I'm not too worried about the situation. Unless unless Hoybier or uh, Benting will pick up an injury as well, then you start to worry. And all of a sudden, Winks is coming back in. <laughs> and you're thinking, oh, God. Uh, then again, maybe Winks having a game or two could be the best thing. So he needs to, go, so he needs to find someone to sign him. But, um, maybe that's not the best thing then. Yeah, true. <laughs> um, good point. But, yeah, look. I'm not too worried about it. Uh, Benton Core and Hoybier did very well. Yeah, people like people act like when we when, when people say like, "Oh, it's going to be a similar team to what ended last season." People start complaining and panicking. It's like we won ten of our last fourteen games. It's like this is a good team. And we I, did oh, lose to Southampton at home, though. We did lose Southampton at home, but that was um, Kuliszewski and Benton Core weren't integrated. They were making their debuts, or something, weren't they? They both came off the bench. They both came off the bench. So. Um, they both came off the bench in that game as well, both games. So I'm not, I'm not too worried about it. Um, I think Southampton should be all right. And uh, look, I think we've got a good team. And we've just, we have added quality to the team. It doesn't necessarily mean that they come in straight away. Because they've already got a good nucleus for the team. Yeah, I, look, I agree. I'm not too worried. I mean, it's a long season. It's not a, like a sprint. It's a marathon. Uh, so these players will be integrated. If they're not integrated in the first game, it's nothing to panic about, let's be honest. But uh, look, that is your Tottenham update from Tel Aviv Beach. We'll be back. We're coming back tomorrow, uh, like I said, if our flight isn't cancelled. So back in the studio for you guys to preview the season on Thursday. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Like, subscribe and comment. And as always, come on, you Spurs. Yeah!